Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for NWHM Presents. My name is Emma, and I'm the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation at the National Women's History Museum, and I will be your host for today. A few housekeeping notes. Our panelists will be answering questions um, really at the end of the conversation, but we're going to try to address questions as they come up in the midst of this conversation. You're welcome to ask your question at any time. We'd also love to hear your thoughts and reactions in the chat, and we will try to respond to those as they come in. And you can use the Q&A feature and the chat feature, um, which are both on your toolbar. And our panelists are happy to answer your questions. And with that, I would love to introduce our guests. Alexandra Delano Alonso is Associate Professor of Global Studies at the New School. Her publications include books and essays on migration, memory, and borders. Her work establishes a conversation between academia, activism, art, and poetry that centers transformation and social justice. Hello, Alexandra. Um, our second guest is Daniela Alatore, and she is a Mexican producer and filmmaker with 19 years of experience in documentary filmmaking and programming. She worked as producer and programmer at the Morelia Film Festival for over 10 years and has been part of the Board of Trustees of the Ambulante Film Festival and the Flaherty Film Seminar. She's over 20 credits as a producer and has worked on many award-winning films. We are really excited for this conversation, and um, thank you, um, Alexandra, and thank Thank you, Daniela, uh, for being with us today. Hi, thank you so much, Emma. Very uh, excited to be here. Yeah. Likewise, well, it's an honor. Thank you. Again, we are so excited to have one, uh, to have both of you here. So uh, to get started, I hope that everyone uh, who is here with us today has had a chance to see your wonderful film. Um, and it's in uh, a, a link that we sent you in preparation for this program. So we would encourage you to watch it um, after the fact if you haven't seen it. But just to get us started, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what was, how did the film start? Where, where did you all start with that? Oh, maybe I can uh, I can begin and then Daniela can continue. Um, but the film I think is 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 not something that we had planned. Um, I I started uh, writing in the in the first few weeks of the pandemic uh, as a journal and taking photographs during walks around my neighborhood in Queens and try to trying to process what it was like to be in quarantine, not really knowing what it was all about. It was kind of a search for breath and a search for a place to hold all these uncertainties and the grief and the just not knowing what was happening. And so I started jotting this down alongside photographs. And after a few weeks, I, I shared it with, with close friends, not as a project that had any goal, but just as something that could connect us in a moment that we're where we were feeling these absences, where we were feeling a need to share our experiences of being confined and sort of bridge bridge the distance. So I I sheepishly shared it with with Daniela just to see what she thought and and what came out of that, and and then Daniela can take over from there. Um, yeah, I was. Um... I was actually staying at, at a small house, like two hours away from Mexico City, close to the forest. Um, I used to spend weekends there. And then I guess I was caught in the middle of closed down in that house. So I stayed for maybe three or four months. It was a tiny space with like no rooms. Everything was open. And, and just to get out of there every day, I would take walks in the forest. That was something that I feel like a lot of people did take walks or going to open spaces or, or, or kind of try to find um, a little bit of space in, in nature if, if people could do that. And when Alice sent me things that she was writing because it was an ongoing thing that she would go out and write these things, um, I, you know, I immediately thought, I think that I can, I, whatever my experience is going out on my walks is something that is in conversation with what my very dear friend is doing in another part of the world 
under different circumstances, but we're also kind of reflecting uh, on similar things. So I said, why don't I go to Mexico City, grab my camera, and then we start some sort of correspondence. It was, it was, it wasn't necessarily uh, intended to be a film. It was like, let's, let's try to make something that is a correspondence. And, and then Ali would send me a few things and I would uh, record things that I would see. And then that's how I started putting it together. And then I was thinking more of um, what I needed these images um, for, for these images to become a, a film. So I was like, okay, so we need the audios. These are, these are written words, but what if there was a recording? So I was like, can you record these things with your kids? And I would be recording the same things with my kids. And that's how we had sort of uh, a palette of images and sounds that then turned into the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I love this kind of idea of a conversation because the, the film itself, is a conversation that's told both in English and Spanish. So uh, could you talk a little bit about your choices to use uh, both languages and the ways in which you decided what would be in English, what would be in Spanish, um, and how that kind of contributed to this idea of a conversation? Um, well, we're both Mexican and I live in New York. Um, and I was surprised at the fact that when I was journaling and writing and, and beginning to to assemble these fragments into poems that they were naturally coming out in English and Spanish and Spanglish um, and and it was I, I think a, a, a representation of of what I was living which was conversations with my family and my friends in Mexico and conversations with uh, people in New York hearing the news in both countries uh, around what was happening and, and for a moment in time we were kind of all talking about the same thing, our personal experiences um, and, and, and what was happening around COVID um, politically and also in terms of the health emergency. And, and these conversations in English and, and in Spanish were just crossing over in a, in a very clear way that I, I, it, was, it was difficult and, and anti-natural for me to separate them. And Normally I would, I, I translate my work in, into English or Spanish and I you know, talk to one audience in one language and then in the other, but this became a space where you know, poetry allowed for that too, um, to open up a space where the in-betweenness of being you know, between two, two countries, between the interior and exterior that, that COVID and quarantine kind of pushed on to so many of us, um, that it felt natural to, to do it in this way and to respect and honor and also um, allow that space to, to be generative, that space of crossing over in two languages. I think it also expresses the fact that it was a, a global experience, right? We're only using two languages here, but it's kind of showing these, these similar conversations happening across the world in, in different languages in two places, and yet we were connected in that experience. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that I, I feel like there was also um, an intention of, of making a film that felt very intimate, but it wasn't physically located anywhere. It just, it could feel that that forest could be anywhere. And we didn't want, we wanted our kids to be there and the voices and the song that I you know, the, the lullaby that I sing to my children every night when I put them to bed, but it, their faces weren't there. So it, it was kind of like also these space of intimacy that you could feel feel like a very familiar space without making it specific of a story that is specifically about Daniela and, and, and Alexandra. Um, and I, I think that that's something that has resonated in the past when we get feedback from people watching the film that it feels like it could be an experience that they it resonates with their own experience that it mirrors some of their experience but it still feels very intimate because it is about these two women in different parts of the world so it, it's always nice to hear from um how people uh feel or, or or feel the film mirrors somehow or questions how they were um experiencing these fears and these moments that felt that was never going to go away. 
I, I, I love this idea of in-betweenness because hearing both of you talk about this, and I, and I wonder if um, our audience members also, uh, the word in-betweenness is, it resonates with them because for me, it somehow encompasses a lot of my experience of the pandemic. And I would, I would love to return to this as, as, a, as a kind of way of framing the pandemic and specifically maybe a woman's experience of the pandemic. I'd, I'd love to talk about that more in a, in a minute and hear from our audience. Um, I'm kind of sticking with the, the film as a, as a piece of art that was produced. I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the production of the film, given that you were in two different places and that you two were having a conversations about, you know, and then how that goes into a film about conversations. Um, I, I guess it was a very unusual production of a film because we we wanted to make a film, but we also knew that we were in different parts of the world. And I was, you know, getting the footage. I was actually doing the photography myself. I mean, we were all kind of on our own. Um, and then I was also editing and kind of exchanging a lot of these ideas with Ale. First, I started editing myself. And then I asked a friend of mine who had edited a previous film that I, I directed if she would be willing to collaborate. It also felt um, for the production that it was, um, I feel like a lot of people decided we needed a space to uh, think or feel what we were experiencing beyond words. I feel like it ended up being like calling people or WhatsApping people or like Zooming people, how are you? Like the words, how are you, were always there. And, and I feel like those questions didn't really help us with the experience that we were having. We were just like checking in, but we needed other ways of um of just addressing thinking um of our experience and i think that's why a lot of people created uh you know decided art pieces or or, or writing or, or or you know everyone's asked everyone's asking like what was your pandemic hobby because it, and maybe it's art and maybe it's something that needed to connect with how we were feeling and seeing the world differently but i feel like we we just needed that um to find that space beyond words. So going back to production, um, we were basically producing, you know, long distance in these in-betweenness because I had the footage, I was downloading it, I was editing. And, and then I was like, okay, I think we need more sounds from these or from that, or can you record these? And then I was integrating all these things. Um, and then the eventually it felt like a film that could actually turn into a film so I called uh, a lot of friends here in Mexico City that do like sound design and I um, called a musician who lives in New York who had you know sent some cues for a previous film that I was producing and I was like we're using these can we use it for these films so I, I think it also opened the possibility of having conversations at different levels and people being involved uh, with a reflection that at least forced everyone to ask themselves where they were standing. I I think I would just add how much making this film together was a refuge that mm -hmm. in this moment where um you know we were it was so difficult to be together and 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 do something like this you know that generally requires both people sitting in a room and and looking at it together or or doing a sound recording in a studio i was recording it the, the recording that you hear of my voice is me in my backyard with an audio recorder and then sending it to danny so this was very much i think that feeling of of how it is very much homemade um all of it and through friends and family um, is part of that intimacy and and part of what I for us I think sustained us through 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 the many months of of production and especially those months of um, of quarantine where we had this place to come together and not just be making the film but be talking about our experiences and the film and and for me the writing also changed as a result of the conversation that we were having and you know I, I had written this. Um, 
for myself first and didn't think that it was going to be shared, as I said, but I had written it alongside images of, of trees in Queens that were very different from the images that Danny had. And, and that was so beautiful and expansive to feel that this conversation could go to other places that could open up other registers for, for someone who was living it in a, in, a, in a different context. And so that reflected back onto me and how I was processing my own experience of, um, of being in, in this moment. So th I think that was, um, that was a, the, the importance of the film, regardless of where it went, right? That there were these moments are, what are we going to make out of this? But it was just the, the practice and the commitment to be in this conversation together that I think was so profound for both of us. Yeah, so, um, I mean, Alexandra, you just started talking about uh, your, your writing and I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, this intersection between your poetry and the film. And I'm gonna share um, a link uh, to learn more about um, Alexandra's book. And I'd love for you to talk about this while I'm sharing some still images from, from the film, uh, because I think the ways in which you were talking about how the words that you were writing were about, well, you were seeing different things than what Daniela was seeing that she put in the film. So I, I'll share my screen, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about, about the writing and the intersection between poetry and film. Yeah, um, well, I think, um how I saw it at the time was that there was no way to to write or to process what was happening unless it was through poetry um, because poetry poetry has this openness right and and in that moment um, this this sense of fragmentation that I, I was living and I know many people share this sense of you know not 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 having this uh, sense of time and 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 the way that we organize our lives and suddenly there's this fragmentation of uh, of ourselves and and the lives that we are used to living um, and how that you know, how to make sense of that and then the words that were coming up and and for me arranging them in a in a linear sentence was impossible it made no sense and so poetry was the the only way that I felt like I could put this on a piece of paper and process it. Um, and then eventually share it. Um, but I think Daniela really, before I knew it was a poem, I think Daniela read it as a poem and then made that, translated that into the images and, and the way that she, um, you know, when I saw her sequences of what she was filming in response to what I was writing, then I felt how the poetry was becoming. Yeah, and I'm just uh, sharing some of the images uh, that you shared with me. And I think, you know, kind of looking at these images, and in particular, um, you shared some images that are images of images. And I think going back to this, this discussion of in-betweenness and intimacy, um, where many of us really were stuck inside for months on end. I know I certainly was, um, where I could take a walk, but many of those walks felt aimless because I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I'd like to dwell a little bit more on this question of in between us and intimacy, particularly when it comes to space. So as I'm sharing these pictures of the still images, can you explain um, both why you chose to include images of images and then a little bit more about why, you know, how those images really helped you reflect on these questions of space during the pandemic. Um, so at certain point in the conversation with Ali, um, we were talking about how much being in one space allowed a lot of our friends to see things in different ways. like you would be in a room that you had been many hours before at a time or maybe with with a time and a space that you've never had before. And then you were like, oh, it's so pretty how the light just hits that corner. And it, it was like, I, I'd love to see what other friends, um, actually, we wrote to a lot of our female friends, how, what, what is it? Can they share images that they've been doing on their phone um, just of things that they have 
photograph because you are in a space and sometimes you're like, oh, it's just really pretty and there's so much silence and it, it's really pretty how the light hits the wall right now. Um, so we wanted, uh, we, we wanted to include images that felt that there were spaces in which our friends were enclosed. Um, that's an image, for example, the, the day that I cut my kid's hair. It was something also that we just had to do. Um, and I wanted to bring these images of the different ways that we saw our enclosed spaces in outdoors, into, into in, but physically. Like, it wasn't like I wanted to um, impose those images on the editing. It's like I was I wanted to print those pictures and then bring them to the forest, just the possibility of taking things out. Um, maybe, you know, it's also um, wanting to go out and wanting things to be uh, not enclosed. And it also felt a really nice, it also felt like a really nice way of, of also reaching out to friends. Um, I wanted also Ale to send me the pictures that she was taking on her phone. I wanted her pictures to be sent from phone to phone and then for me to print them and bring them to the forest where I was shooting. Um, and it felt like it was also a way of bringing Ale to the place that I was getting the images from. Um, so a lot of my friends just sent me pictures and I created all these folders and I printed a lot of pictures and then I brought them to a forest and I wanted also um, other voices and other ways of seeing being close to all that time to be part of these film. I mean, it was a conversation, but we also wanted it to be a conversation, larger conversation than just between Nalia and myself. I think I would add that um, part of the, the conversation that is um, between the the poems and the images of the trees and then the images that Daniela captured in the forest and these pictures is this um, juxtaposition of the inside and the outside and mm -hmm. how much during COVID we, our perspective on both of those shifted or became, you know, exacerbated our perception of the inside. And also the moments, like you were saying, when you were walking outside, how you were experiencing very different that, mm -hmm. um, that moment, right, that we take for granted and suddenly we were um, slowing down, listening, perceiving, feeling our spaces in a different way, both the inside and the outside. So I think that when Danny made that choice of, of, of bringing the pictures out to the first, I thought it was a, a really beautiful and poetic way of, of generating that conversation. Um, and for me, one, one uh, central aspect of <clears throat> what was grounding me in in these day daily experiences of writing and going out for a walk and and you know living the experience of of the pandemic with my with my children very intensely at home was to know that have this sense that there, there was so much uncertainty we didn't lo know how long it would last we mm -hmm. didn't know what was happening um you know we couldn't get in touch with many people all of these uncertainties and at the same time there was this huge powerful certainty in nature, nature continuing. And this was the spring of 2020. And it was right when the first blossoms were starting. And it was just for me, this sense of, yes, we don't know a lot, but we know this one, this one thing does know what is happening and it's continuing and it's grounding, at least it was grounding me in a, in a very powerful way. Um, and also in, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of a shared experience was this feeling of you know confinement but not just the space spatially but it inside ourselves and then suddenly to be able to go out and breathe and that that reminder that that nature is um and so i think that was also a very w powerful way in which daniela captured this by by putting these images on the ground in the forest and i remember when she told me i'm gonna try this and we'll see what happens um, and and there was a lot of experimentation, and then but her instinct was was so right. And then when I saw it, I was uh, really you know blown away by by the beauty of it and what it was generating beyond any expectation that I that I could have had. Well, I wanted to add also now that you were talking because one of the things that we really wanted to play with was sound. I mean, the images of the film are very restrictive to the space I was confined in and those walks in the forest. And I agree, Emma, like the going out on walks, you, you couldn't really go anywhere. And you would maybe walk by a park and it was 
complete just the, the silence the lack of of what usually the sounds that are usually part of those spaces was very strange um and it, it also created like um this emptiness of when is this going to be over I also feel like that's why you know I I watch the film again now and there's 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 there was lots of of um big questions and lots of fears is this ever gonna go away right we we just had that big question um but we wanted to play with sound so those sounds of kids in the playground of songs of conversations all these things that are happening in 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 these spaces we wanted to just bring them as another layer um of things that either were happening you know we have sounds of the, you know, a hospital bed, or we have sounds of a playground, or we have sounds of a home, or we have songs, sounds of like a, an intimate moment of putting your kids to sleep um, with, with a lullaby. And, and these were just ways of, of just bringing life back into those outdoor spaces um, and, and making, maybe making reference to that, that was lacking um, on that everyday life and those those months that were so silent and um, and also forced us to reflect in different ways. Yeah, and I, I want to kind of continue on this thread of reflection, right? We are three years from really when everything shut down. I mean, it was March 2020. We're in April 2020. Um, mm -hmm. It feels both so distant and yet so close. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly with this question of reflection and the these ideas of of the lightness and the and you know compared with the the uncertainty and you have these beautiful you know beautiful images of a dragonfly in the film and and you know beautiful light that comes in in these shots on top of um the the text is reading the number of cases mm -hmm. so how do we remember and reflect on both these really dark moments and also these bright moments. I mean, how do we kind of wrestle with the tension um, that was so inherent in our lived experiences for, for the pandemic? I know that's a big question, but I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I, I wanted to start, I think, by saying that it's very hard for me to read what I wrote and to watch the film now. Um, because I feel that there's a part of me that doesn't want to go back to some of the heaviness and the weight, but at the same time, there is so much that I do want to return to. And I, I do watch it and I do reread the book because there are moments that I don't want to forget. Uh, and some of them are the, the intimacy that I created or that we created with our, with my children. Um, that that closeness that was really difficult and exhausting, and at the same time, it was, you know, it it cannot be replicated or substituted. Like the relationships that were built because we had that year or longer when they were not at school, um, they were at home, and the you know the the poems and the film reflect very much this listening to our children and holding. You know, there's a there's a line in the book that says loss and play. How do you hold loss and play at the same time and really be present for both of those things at the same time? And it's so real because it's happening in our daily life always. But the pandemic exacerbated that, you know, very intensely at the same time because there was no pause. There was no you go to school and I deal with this. It was I deal with this loss and I deal with you asking me to play or you asking me a question at the same time. Um, and that was really difficult, but I think it brought us to a to a closeness and, and building relationships that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so that's that's one part that I that I return to, and I know that the the foundation of it is still with us. But I like returning to that. I like returning to the questions that my children were asking me, and to how I saw myself listening to that. And I think the sounds in the film that Daniela was talking about are, for me, are 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 so precious and so beautiful because. So much of our experience was not just about how we were looking or how we were feeling, but it was also very much about what we were hearing. You know, the ambulances and 
those everyday sounds, maybe the birds that we might have not have heard before, or they weren't there before. And so um, I think that experience of listening um, for me is something that I do want to return to and that, that I don't want to lose. Um, you know, when, when Arun Dati Roy wrote about the pandemic as this portal, as this opening and this challenge to how we live as a society and, and so many of the questions of what we think is essential, non-essential, um, why was there a disproportionate impact of COVID on some communities of color? and not on others. And, and all of these questions that are profound and that aren't just about the pandemic that are about how we have built our society. And, and that's reflected in the, in the film and that's reflected in the, in the poems. And, and those are things that I don't want to lose sight of and that I, that I think are very valuable things that we lived through and reflected collectively and that we need those reminders. We need to go back to them um, you know, there is a heaviness. There are things that we maybe, like I myself, sometimes don't want to read or, or come back to, but there are others that I find extremely powerful and and foundational in how I see myself now, what was transformed in me during those months and years. Yeah, I I love how you're you're talking about the kind of not wanting to forget, and I'm I'm just realizing, you know, seeing myself on camera, that the image that I have here is I I ripped it out of the New Yorker magazine, but it's a picture of Park Avenue taken during the pandemic, Park Avenue, New York City, completely empty of cars and people, which is not normal. I mean, that's not what you see on a New York City street, and. I have this in every in my background every single time I get on the camera, and I didn't even realize that I put that up there as a way of remembering. And yet, I don't want to remember the fear that I had about what was happening to my family in New York. I mean, I didn't. I don't want to remember the fear of my grandparents and not knowing if, you know, if they were going to be safe the next day. <laughs> my apologies, but yeah, there's. I think that that tension there between having these moments to actually be and sit and think and just be with the people who you cared about the most, really making the time for people um, and having the time to make the time. I don't want to forget that. And here's my constant reminder. So yeah, just my reflection on what you're sharing, Alexandra. Yeah. Um, I don't have much to add, but I was, I was just going to say that I really like that you brought um, up these idea of play just during the pandemic like just being with our I was with my son I only had um, um, a two-year-old back then and I guess there was like a constant search of how to uh, maintain that play and that space even with the heaviness and the um silence and just being worried and 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 knowing that um there was so much going on and and that tension of of something so um obscure with like trying to find a, a little space of of lightness and 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 play and and just present with kids i think it was a, a very unusual thing because it was forcing uh, these fear into a space that you just had to build the possibility of play and the possibility of them feeling that things were gonna be okay. And that that was, I think, one of the hardest things during that those months. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I kind of want to take what both of you have said, because both of you have mentioned your role as mothers, as, as something that both you was could at times be very difficult when you didn't have that separation from your kids, where you had to kind of put away your fears and uncertainties to be present. Um, and yet those moments that you had with your kids were so important. And that leads me to that question of, and it's also something that uh, Christine in our audience has mentioned that there's this real kind of feminist lens, um, particularly with the the images of images in the film. And that leads me to this question of, you know, what is 
the specific women's perspective on the pandemic that is present um, in the book of poetry, in the film, and then again, big question. But what do you think is the is the women's perspective on the on the pandemic? How do women reflect specifically on the pandemic? I know, I, big question. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know if there's one answer to that question, but I feel like, at least from the the specific experience of making these film together and creating these conversations we were really bringing intimate things into like a larger narrative and i think that's definitely just like a lullaby or you know watching my kid learning how to walk in the forest or um ale's son saying i don't think god exists like i look out the window on an airplane and I don't see him or there's nothing there. There's nothing there. So, or big questions like do wild animals get it? Are they going to get sick too? Like, I, I feel like this bringing these intimacy into a space of a larger narrative um, is, is something that I feel that comes um, from, from a perspective of, of, of women, like, because the, because personal it is political, right? Those very intimate moments are the ones that if you bring it to a larger narrative and, and there's like conversation with what's happening with the numbers, with um, someone got sick, like Ale decided instead of using names to just use the letters and the letters meaning that those letters could be used for anyone. Um, and the fear was shared and we saw the numbers and we were um, trying to point out at the things happening at a news level, but those were at the same, in, in conversation with the most intimate moments of questions and play and, and those relationships with their kids. So I think that's also part of um, just understanding that that is also part of a larger narrative. Maybe that's what I would say. Yeah, and I'm going to share my screen with an image of one of these intimate moments of of a child's hand. Um, just uh, Alexandra, while you're, if you have thoughts. I mean, I I think Lenny captured it really well. But I I mean, I obviously uh, a lot of what comes up here is is a question of care, right? And um, and as women, what that what that means, and and in in many many ways, and I think the you know the fact that we are mothers um, is very present. But for me, it was this um, how to reflect on the fact that we are mothers and many other things um, at the same time, and we are um, navigating these uh, these roles and these experiences uh, as women along together all the time um, and I think that's that's kind of the rhythm and the conversation that that for me was important to to make present for myself and for my children that I, I am here com, you know with them 24 7 and I am present for for that role as a caregiver but I'm also all these other things and I'm thinking of these questions that they're asking me but I'm also thinking about what is happening politically or what they are telling me, not just about my child's experience, but about a larger um, a larger structure and a larger experience of this beyond my intimate space and how to make those conversations um, enlarge each other. Um, I think that was, that was what was powerful um, for me and, and maybe at times unintended, but it was also this led by this intuition uh, of uh, what is the conversation um, that I that I felt necessary to be a part of, and that I wanted to have with with the people I loved, and um, you know the the honor that that it has become larger than just sharing it with uh, with the people closest to me. That we can now share it with a with a broader audience, and and how collectively we make sense of this. Um, th uh, thank you for for sharing that. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just I'm just sitting here and I'm trying to reflect on, you know, my own experience of the pandemic. And I was not dealing with with young children. I I mean, I was my intimate space was a cat and and of and a fiance and the ways in which there was that um 
you know, isolation and joy, but very different than than what you two um, are describing and yet these kind of similarities. And uh, for those of you in our audience, if you have reflections um, on your pandemic experience, we'd love uh, for you to share those in the chat. Um, and also, again, uh, our uh, Alexandra and Danielle are happy to answer any of your questions about their film um, or the book of poetry or, you know, their own experiences. So I guess um, while we are uh, while we are still talking about this, this question of um, experience, could both of you just kind of briefly expand on, you know, what was your experience of the pandemic? What, what did that kind of two and a half, three years look like in a kind of short summary? <laughs> I don't know if I remember it well. It's very strange, but I think that because there was so much time in one space and and a lot of the times, um, I feel like I, I feel like time behaves in a very funny way with memory during the pandemic. And I I, I think it's um it has to do with how we also perceived details during that time. Um, so I don't know if I can summarize, but I I wanted to say uh, from the images that you shared, Emma, there's a there's an image of of these um, of of a of a roof, right? With with um, with the rain, and I remember when we started the conversation. I remember sitting, uh, probably my kid was asleep taking a nap and I was just sitting at my window and I started watching it, it just started raining and I I would see how uh the drops of rain would just fall on that on that material and then they would just kind of disappear and it was very clear to me that it, it felt to me of how many people were getting sick and how many people were were um, getting affected in 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 deep ways by the pandemic and by COVID and 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 so many people dying everywhere and and there was nothing that we could do we could just there was just a feeling of of having to um, just be a, a, a spectator of of what was happening um, and I see these images and I and I do remember. Uh, like uh, just being very, um, uh, I could see a lot more details. There was there was just more time to perceive things. Like I see that hand going over um, the bark of the tree, and there was obviously these sense of like there's the softness of a new life, just trying to feel you know the the bark of an old tree, and it, it like everything felt like a reflection and on how new generations were going to be affected by by these experience what means being born in in the middle of of the situation with the uncertainties without the touch right because this is all about touch it's also like a very young age that where they they're looking for the touch so i i don't know if i can summarize my experience of the pandemic but i but i do remember that i was more aware of like small details um in in general i feel like the everything going really fast is is very easy uh to be short sighted about small things happening and i do remember that as, as part of the fear and the un or uncertainty trying to gasp whatever pieces of light you could find around but also just a space to see things differently yeah, I, I love that idea because one of the refrains that I always heard with the pandemic was life slowed down, right? You know, people weren't going to an office, people um, weren't running around and that life slowed down. And I think that's, there was a kind of negative connotation to that phrasing, mm -hmm. but the way that you're describing it, Daniela, is that there was a, a new way in which that slowness allowed us to notice and be in touch with and react to and that it actually could have been a great positive. Um, it wasn't that life slowed down. It was that life took a slightly different, slower turn. But that's not bad. So I just wanted to share that reaction. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, I was also going to say that it was also very much depending on what you had to do. So many people had to go out and still work and still uh, figure out ways. Um, you know, I, I remember seeing Mexico City after maybe three or four months, I came back to the city and it was obviously very clear that some people could stay at home and some people just couldn't stay at home. Some people would just have to go out and do whatever there was out there to to try to make a living. Um, and that was also very clear, just, just knowing if you could stay or you couldn't stay. And that also kind of forces you to see yourself in different ways. Um, and there, there's a, a question on how did we occupy our time during the pandemic to get in a sense of health and well-being? I, I think for me, it's basically I was taking walks um, as much as I could in the forest. It was it was an open space. And I also really liked cutting hair of, of the people there. So I, I started the cutting hair of my husband and my son because I, I just felt like there was a, a, a physicality and an intimacy to it, to it that I that I really liked um, cooking. Um, and 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 trying to 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 stay connected and also trying to figure out ways in which I could also help my company survive. It was very. I mean, I, I'm um, I have a, a production company. We make films, and it was also really hard to be in a moment so that we couldn't really do a lot. We had a film that we have finished, so we basically pushed for that film that was finished to do the post-production and then be able to take it out there and figure out ways on the virtual world um, to continue conversations about film, about things that I cared about um, and, and also stay present. Um, and I was gonna say that um, I also got pregnant in the middle of the pandemic, so it was like I just had to focus on on this new life. I I was I was even more isolated even when people started going out. I, I was I was just in fear of exposing myself. So I also kind of stayed very much enclosed in in in, in very small groups and and that was like taking decisions. I really wanted to see my father. So I decided I didn't want to I couldn't really see my friends. I was, I, I really just needed to see my father because he's alone. So those type of decisions also um, force you to, to um, set up your priorities and, and make sure that that is also a, a well-being, just being clear about what you need to do. Um, I think I would add, <clears throat> I think that just the, the starting point of this question is, is what we remember. Right and um, and how interesting it is that that a moment that we lived so intensely, uh, so deeply that now three years later, I think most people would answer like Danny, like oh there there are some things I don't remember, uh, and also like the the sense of time shifted so much and and you know you say like oh did this happen in two thousand twenty or twenty one like I just no sense of of how those months passed very differently and now trying to return to some of those memories is difficult. Um, we presented the film uh, in 2021 at a memory studies conference, and one of the most interesting things that came up in that conversation in, in the discussions, reflections of our film is that they said this is kind of an anticipatory memory process because we were already documenting something that when we didn't even know that it was something to be remembered, right? Like the first few days of the pandemic, maybe it could have lasted, we quarantine could have lasted a week. And we, no one could have known what it would be, but we were already writing and documenting and trying to have a record of something that felt really important and meaningful. Um, and I think that's, uh, it's such an interesting thing to reflect on of what is it that we remember, what we don't, and, and what does a process of uh, memory in the context of COVID entail? As a, not, just, not just the, obviously we have to honor and remember those who died, um, and who are ill and who are still ill, but also like as collect as a society, what are, what are these things that we live through and and how to process the trauma, but also remember the the lessons as we discussed earlier. And I think for me, the one of the most important things is was this change in the sense of time. At the beginning, when my kids suddenly their school was closed and they were home, 
I just thought these teachers are heroes. How do they deal with my kids for eight hours or however long it is? I don't know how to fill the hours in the day to get them through the school day and then do all our other things. So that, that process of adjustment was really hard and also really fun, you know, to create our school at home, to come up with a schedule together of what that would mean and, and try to have an activity, you know, a new activity all the time to keep us all, um, you know, from, from going crazy. And so um, I think that was, that's something that I remember with as a hard thing, but also with joy in terms of the creativity that came out from all of us in maybe talking about things or doing things that we didn't, we hadn't even thought of sharing. And suddenly we learned so much about each other and what we were able to bring like a, an art project or, or a cooking or something that we, in the day-to-day -day maybe we wouldn't have shared. Um, and I think the other thing that I remember, I'm a professor and so I had to switch to teaching online and, and so many of us, you know, made that switch to, to work um, online or to, you know, do our work in a very different mode. And what, uh, what I remember from that and, and that has transformed me is uh, how, how, how we hold space for each other when, when we cannot be present, when we cannot have like our rituals as, as communities and societies are so important. Um, rituals of joy and rituals of, of grief and we couldn't have those and you know the classroom the classroom is a ritual like uh, meetings are rituals in some ways of course there were more important rituals that we needed to have and we couldn't and so for me it was this transforming my sense of what kind of teacher I was and how I needed to hold space that wasn't just about the lesson we were learning that it was also about creating relationships with each other um, in a different way that could sustain us. And I think that that has some, that is something that has uh, lasted for me. Um, and for, you know, that, that relates to um, Christine's question of, um, was it Christine? Uh, anonymous, anonymous question of how like our wellness or health routines during that period to sustain ourselves, especially if you're exhausted, you know, by, by holding other people. Uh, and so I think for me it was, walking and it was writing and it was making this film that was what made me feel like I was processing this and feeling sustained and loved and and sharing this you know with with Danny and also with uh, with the trees <laughs> and and walking in nature uh, was so important and it's something that I have maintained since yeah I mean as a as a historian I love this conversation about how did we you know create how did we create memory? What is, what do we remember? And what is the moment at which we all realized that we were living through something profound and how, you know, what one member of our audience shared that unfortunately they lost many people during the pandemic. And for them, the pandemic is a profound moment of loss. Whereas for others, it's a profound moment of lost time where time got flattened and thinking back on the pandemic will be a very different type of, of experience because it will, you know, as you were saying, Alexandra, it doesn't have the dates. Those dates are very squidgy, whereas for others, they can mark that day to day because they had some sort of profound, um, profound trauma or moment to center their memory around. Um, and, you know, I, I kept the first mask I ever made out of a t-shirt. I don't know why I did that, but something in the back of my head must have said, you're living through history. You should save this. Um, so I just, I wanted to, to respond to, to what both of you were saying, because I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, and we have another, uh, question from our audience, which is, the, it, did the extreme polarization that developed during the pandemic inform the art you created uh, at all during the pandemic? Ali, ¿quieres contestar? Or I can. Um, 
I was just wondering about the the writing because um, um, I think it was more, and these are conversations that we did have, you know, how do we, how do we bring into the film that we're making and, and these conversations a sense that there is also a political thing happening at the same time that we're having a very intimate reflection on what's happening in our homes with our kids. Um, we didn't want the film to go there because going into all these obviously polarization that was happening that we were aware of um, wasn't necessarily something that we knew exactly how was it happening, just reflecting on that. But we did want it to include certain things that pointed out this is happening at the same time that we are trying to have these conversations about the experience we're having. I also feel like all these polarization and 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 it also forced us, Ale, myself, but I'm sure just so many people to understand the privilege that we lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also very clear just to have space to play or, um, or, or just reflect on the time that you could spend um, not necessarily, um, you know, doing a lot of things or trying to figure out immediately after things started to open. Um, so I think that was part of the conversation. Uh, and that's why we have all these moments where we're pointing or, or trying to to create a, a thread into these political things that were happening at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I think for me, it was, as we were saying before, impossible to separate the, the personal from the political. Um, I think the, the way that the pandemic exacerbated the inequalities that were already there, and we started seeing them so close you know, in, uh, I was in Queens, you know, at one point was the epicenter of the epicenter and just seeing the, the disproportionate impact on, on especially Latino and black communities. Um, you know, there's this line in the film and in the poem that says, you know, what we let go, who dies, linked fates. And, and this sense of, you know, how are we experiencing this sense of transforming what is, how we see what's essential, non-essential, valuing essential workers, clapping for them, at 7 p.m. every night, and how long is that going to last? And, and what does that really mean in terms of um, ch challenging the structures that, that make them live in precarious lives where they can't, um, you know, they can't stay at home, they have to continue working and, and, and to keep those questions at the center and at the same time be reflecting on our, on our intimate lives and what was happening to us, what is the possibility of bringing those together and bringing those together and how can that be transformative um so i think definitely i i love this question because it was it was so much at the center and hopefully that that's something that um that can continue to be in our public conversation um for me like uh once once the quarantine ended in new york uh and we were still you know schools were still not open but we were able to move around a little bit and um my kids and i got involved in a mutual aid soup kitchen in the bronx um with la morada and we're still we're still volunteering there, and um, it was such an important element of understanding what was happening. Who did not have access to food? Um, who was lining up outside, you know, for hours to get some kind of health support or clothes or food or a mask, uh, and what that meant, and how we were living and seeing our, our lives and our city in such a different way. Um, and I think that was. Uh, central and and hopefully it's captured in 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 this work that that we made together. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I think that really gets at what I feel like is almost the one of the themes of our conversation today, and, and you know one of the at the heart of how we reflect on the pandemic is this question of in betweenness and this question of tension, the tension between the personal and the political, the in betweenness of the personal and political. And um, you know the tension between what was gained and what was lost, and how even those gains, maybe these perspectives that you've been talking about, 
that they can still be lost and we we can't we can't lose sight of of these new perspectives that hopefully um, we gained uh, during the pandemic and during the time. So I want to end and I want to thank um, our audience uh, for joining us and sharing their their reflections and their questions. But I want to end on a kind of final question for you two, which is when um, when our audience watches your film, what do you hope they take away from it? What 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 do you what do you hope their kind of their major takeaway is when they watch your film? Um. Well, I was thinking of how much when I when I wrote this and and then the collaboration with Danny um has all been this process and and i think that's the beauty of poetry and the beauty of fragments is that uh, they can be reassembled and that they can grow and they can shift and i have loved seeing people take this and do some with thing with it so danny uh, with danny we made the film and then with shasad the the musician we've done other musical collaborations and then there's been art and we've had workshops where people take a fragment and then write their own poem and so what I uh, feel really excited about is how watching this film or reading the poems can be a space where where people feel reflected and feel that they can then process their own experience take something from it to develop their own their own response and their own um, their own ground where they can um, think about their experience and, and where that can take them uh, creatively or just as a place to to hold uh, whatever needs to be held, the, the joys or the grief or both. Um, I, I was going to say that I, um, I had a conversation recently um, with someone. We, I presented a film that's a film that I produced that it's not um, fragmentos and she said thank you for for these film I I I really need more films for the body um and I and I continued the conversation because there is something very clear about when films um force you to um experience them from a more sensory level rather than for your mind <laughs> you know we can understand things but it's very clear from the film that we were at a moment where we did not understand things and there are other th ways of understanding things without trying to process them so I also feel like um, a space to just a, a sensory space to remember but memories are also a, a sensory space. It, they don't have to be clear. They don't have to be placed in a specific um, space, but there is a feeling of how do you remember, how your body remembers that space that you were at and how your body remember um, that connection and that loss and those things that you were missing. And then the first time you hugged or you were able to see someone that you couldn't see for a very long time. So I also hope that this is a, a space where people can sense those things um, uh, with their bodies, just kind of experience and remember how that experience was and how that connection was and how that just hugging someone that you couldn't hug for a really long time felt. So maybe I would feel it more at a sensory level if um, if people can can get that out of the film. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alexandra and Daniela, for for sharing those those hopes, um, and also just for sharing your art with us and your reflections and your thoughts. Um, I I know our audience has loved this conversation as have I, and it's given me a new a new way of reflecting on what was an incredibly difficult and confusing uh, period in both my life and 
you know, the community. So uh, again, I just want to thank you both for being with us this evening and thank you for our audience for joining. Um, and with that, I wish everyone a healthy and safe uh, rest of your Thursday and looking forward to the weekend. And again, Alexandra and Daniela, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And I think it was an inspiration for us too to see the, the COVID journaling project that, that you all led at the um, yeah. at the museum and, and the, how important it is to have those spaces where we're collecting and reflecting together continuously. So thank you. Yes, and, and please, if you haven't seen the uh, chronicling COVID-19 at uh, uh, National Women's History Museum, uh, please go to our website, www.womenshistory.org, and you can see um, other women's reflections on the pandemic, um, and you will uh, hopefully find uh, something that also inspires you, and you can, uh, again, in the way that Alexandra and Danielle, I think, have inspired us tonight. So again, Alexandra, Daniela, thank you so much. And thank you again to our audience. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.